Good day everyone, everywhere, and special greetings to all those seated in heavenly places in Jesus our Messiah. The name of this broadcast is Cross the Border and I'm Nicholas. And uh, this morning is our uh, live uh, prophecy reality news edition. Um, I don't really have a uh, formal broadcast uh, all planned out for today. so. We're going to kind of wing it. I've got some ideas of things I want to talk about. And I'm glad to see that we got a few people showing up in the chat room on uh, this fine morning. So uh, it's good to see you all there. Uh, Christopher Charles and James and uh, and uh, Jeremy and, and, and others in the chat room whom I know. And some, uh, I can't remember exactly what their monikers, who who the real name is behind the monikers, but I, I know that I know them all. <laughs> so anyway, and uh, good morning, everyone. Let's see. Um, here's some things I wanted to talk about this morning. I'll give you kind of an idea of where I'm going and uh, with some questions and some comments here. Um, we're going to talk about elements of prophecy a little bit, trying to sort this whole thing out. And, and actually, I'm kicking around ideas. I'm I uh, would actually like to to write another uh, book uh, along the lines of this one here, Key to the Apocalypse, and uh, because this is a really nice key to have. Everyone should have this in their library. But where this is the key to the apocalypse, um, another book I'd like to write it should be about the same size. I may even combine the two texts together when I get done. And I want to call it Elements of Prophecy. And just some of the questions that we need answered before we can really understand and put all these pieces together. And uh, when to apply the day-year theory and when not to apply it. I think it's a very important question. And if you know what I'm talking about in the historicist method, I, I've seen some make the error. And I think H. Grattan Guineas even goes a little overboard in some of his writing on applying the day-year theory to everything whether it should be applied or not. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. If you got ideas about that, well, I have a number and you can call in when we start talking about it. But when I start talking about it, call in right away, okay? Don't wait until the last five minutes of the broadcast, like so many people do. I hate that. I have a whole two-hour broadcast and then everyone wants to call in at the last five minutes. Um, the second thing, uh, another thing is, what is a beast? We have to discern what the scripture means in prophecy by a beast, what beasts are, you know, in the prophecy. Why, why does one beast have seven heads and all of the other beasts only have one head? What's the difference? What is, what do these seven heads represent that's different about the other beasts in the scripture that only have one head? And this is a this is a huge difference. There's this one beast that has seven heads, but all of the other beasts have only one head. Why? Okay. Um, let's see. And okay, one beast has a notable horn, which was broken off, and then four grew up in its place. The seven-headed beast had ten horns. The earth beast had two horns. What do the horns represent? And uh, so we need to understand these things about what these horns represent when you see horns on a beast, regardless of how many heads it has. And of course, we're going to talk about the diadems or the crowns, especially like on B7 where the, the diadems or the crowns move from the heads to the horns. And then they're gone or something like, or vice versa, whatever. But we need to, those are more elements of prophecy. Um, there's the time stamp elements of prophecy going back to the day year theory. That's kind of a time thing too, but there's a time stamp. Um, what's past, what's present when John writes it and what's future. And then what's present with us. These are 
These are elements of prophecy we need to understand before we can have a clue of what's going on in Daniel and the Apocalypse and the few prophetic uh, passages that are scattered throughout the rest of the Scripture. Um, let's see, what else do we got? Uh, Revelation 17 enumerates seven beast powers. We've talked about this. Uh, and this is part of it, though. Uh, yet only two beasts are explicitly named in the Revelation. And that's the riddle. The seven kings riddle is uh, the kings are identified in uh, verse 11 of chapter 17 as beasts. So they can't be anything else. That's why it's so important to understand what beasts represent in the scripture because we're using the scripture to interpret scripture. And we don't want to stray off into uh, uh, conjecture and uh, speculation but we want to understand what explicitly the scripture says about these things and then apply them uh, consistently because if, if nothing else, uh, any rules or anything we learn from the scripture should be applied consistently unless there's something in the scripture telling us not to apply it consistently. But if you want to use the scripture to interpret scripture, these are questions that must be answered. Let's see. Uh, chapter 17 enumerates seven beast powers. Yet only two beasts are explicitly named in the Revelation. The sea beast and the earth beast are the last two. Who are they and who are the previous five? All very good questions. And that will, that, that will probably call it something like elements of prophecy. Things that once we understand these <clears throat> elements of prophecy, what these symb how to apply these symbols, because we want to interpret as many symbols as we can, then when we read, we, we know what these symbols mean and we have a better understanding. So that's something I just want to kick around and I'd like a lot of uh, as much audience input as I can get on these things. So you can email me, um, you can leave comments on the videos on YouTube if you're doing that. Uh, but subscribe to my blog. Uh, best to leave comments on my blog on the on the page where you're watching this video if uh, that's what you're doing. And that way everyone can read your comments and, and the things that you want to contribute to this uh, investigation. Let's call it an investigation into the elements of prophecy. So we're going to kind of pick up where uh, we left off on Key to the Apocalypse and we're going to... Uh, develop elements of prophecy, something to help us, because this really, this key to the apocalypse really helps. I mean, everyone should have this. Once you have this, you know, read it 10 times. Because <laughs> it's very simple. It's, you know, it's, uh, I think it's 11 point type. This is a pocketbook edition, and it's about 100 pages. So you should be able to do that. You should be able to read this 10 times and really get it into your system. And, um, this is the an updated version um, that of what H. Grant Giddies wrote in 1899. So you can get this in a pocketbook edition for I think less than ten dollars now. And if you're interested in that, let me put something on the screen for everyone that's watching. I have my website here. Let's see somewhere. Oh, okay. And I'll show you how to get this. Um, all of my books have just been published into, let's see, desktop, transition. There we go. We're on the website now. And if you click on the, um, the get the book tab there and see watching me do that on my website and you scroll all the way down to the bottom. This is, these are all trade publications. This is how to get the trade publication. Now, what's the difference between a trade publication and a pocketbook? Well, this is the difference. The difference is size. Right. And the other difference is the trade publication can only, you can, this is what you get when you go to Amazon, Barnes and Noble, or any of those big out book outlets and you order my book, you're going to get the trade publication six by nine, meets certain specifications. And they've got this big, humongous, uh, you know, multi million dollar printer that spits these books out when just, they just put the file in and it's, you know, out the end comes one or ten or whatever you order. It's great. So that's the trade publication. They've got these big printers all over the world so that they can spit these things out and get them to you. That's a trade publication. 
This is a pocketbook edition. And uh, this you can only get from me or at Lulu Press where I have it pressed because these... Uh, these could be put into bookstores at books. If I was selling millions of copies, then they would want these to and ask me and they would buy these from Lulu itself and put them on the shelf so they could sell them. <laughs> That's the only way you get a pocketbook edition. Like, like I'm reading this book right now. Just this is, this is kind of my fun book. It's called Lucifer's Hammer. And, uh, and it's, uh, this was written in the last century though. And it's a, the million copy bestseller about the end of the world. Of course, it's all fiction. And the, why I'm reading this kind of, just kind of for entertainment and, uh, and as a research thing, because I would like to learn how to write a million dollar bestselling fictional book. <laughs> so I figured the best way is to read one or several or whatever it takes. But, but this is a pocketbook size and this only got in there because of the volume. It was selling, so you go to the bookstore and pick this up in a pocketbook edition. See, same size. And, uh, but that's the only way you get a pocketbook edition at the Barnes and Nobles and Amazon and all that is uh, they put them on the shelf. So they, the bookstore actually orders them. So this is hot. We're going to sell a lot of these. So anyway, so if you want to get this, all these in pocketbook edition, go to my get the book page and scroll all the way to the bottom. And there's a link here. It says save with pocketbook editions here. And if you click on that, it'll open up in a new tab and it'll take you right to my, my page on, uh, author spotlight on Lulu press. And as you can see, whatever I published last is on the top. And those are the four pocketbook editions and it saves you quite a bit of money. Another thing is if anyone wants to like get a case of these or give them away, Email me and I'll make sure you get them at the absolute rock bottom price where I don't even make a penny on them. Yeah, I'll do that for you if you want to. Like if you have a class or something, you you want, you know, 20 copies of Key to the Apocalypse or something like that, either trade or or pocketbook. And uh, just email me about that, about uh, volume uh, purchases, and uh, I'll take care of you that way. Okay, so what else do we have in the news today? I got some tamps here. Oh, that's my book. And uh, also, while I'm at it, anyone can get a copy of any of these books for free. Go to my free ebook tab and uh, you can get a PDF. And this is what the PDF looks like, uh, say if you get when the third temple is built. And, and uh, that's what the PDF looks like. You get the cover and all the pages and stuff like that. And that's how it opens up in your browser. If your browser is PDF enabled. And most of them are these days. So uh, you just have to install whatever it on your browser. And you can, or you can get the EPUB version. But absolutely free. And that's by going to my, uh, the free ebook tab. So, and many of you, probably everyone reading, uh, watching this broadcast are, has already got the rapture will be canceled. But if you haven't yet, share all that stuff. If you've already got the rapture to be will be canceled and you want one of these other free PDF EPUBs, all you have to do is help me a little bit, you know. And uh, how you help me is you follow these instructions. You share the page again, okay, and uh, and you comment below saying, uh, well, if you share again and if you've already read The Rapture Will Be Canceled, you want one of these other books, you have to leave a review at Amazon. And almost everyone has an Amazon account. So uh, if you don't, you know, publish a review uh, somewhere on your blog or something or on your Facebook page, write a review if you don't have an Amazon account. So they'll make it a way for you. And then say, then, then comment below. Right. Posted a review on and here Bass Tracker was, I believe, in the chat room says posted review on Rapture will be canceled. Also shared link on my site. Could you please send me PDF version when the third temple is built? Thanks, Nicholas. And uh, so I sent him a copy and that's how you do it. That's how you get your free e-copies of anything and whatever you whatever you want. You just tell me what you want in your comment. And I'll, I'll send you the link to that one first. You can get both the PDF and the free EPUB. Okay, well, that's a lot of homework. 
So take advantage of that, everybody. Okay. Um, let's see. Got a couple news items. Uh, we kind of like because, because we have, because I wrote this book, When the Third Temple is Built. And, uh, this is the kickoff for the rapture. All of the rapturists are waiting for this event. When the third temple is built, the rapture play will begin. <laughs> and there's no doubt about it. And it seems we're on the verge of this temple being built in the next, I would say in the next four years. Yeah. I think it's going to start in the next four years. I really do. So everyone needs this book. Every rapturist, everyone who believes in the rapture needs this book. Okay. So let's, let's take a little of news and then I'm going to look at some emails and other things. And then we're going to spend the remainder of the broadcast kicking around these, uh, elements of prophecy. All right. Let's move. How the third temple is being built today. And this is a, this is from breaking Israel news. That's breaking Israel news.com. So you can check that out. Latest news, biblical perspective. Um, I, I don't know what they believe or even who these people are. This guy, I, he's got a Jewish name, Adam Eliyahu Berkowitz. That's very Jewish. So this may be just a Jewish publication, but if you want to know what's going on in Israel, I guess that's where you got to go. Um, let's see, let me make this a little bit bigger here so I can actually read it without wearing glasses. Haha. -ha. Yes, everyone knows how to do that, right? Make their screen bigger. Okay. How the third temple is being built today. Thus saith Hashim of hosts. And I guess that's how the Jewish people say God, Hashim. Uh, let your hands be strong that you hear the days, the words of the Lord, the mouth of, uh, Nevim that were in the day of the foundation of the house of Hashim uh, of hosts was laid even the temple that might be built. Zechariah 8, 9, the Israel Bible. There you go. That's why it sounds weird. Because it's the Israel Bible. And uh, somebody's got a trademark and all that on that. And so, nice uh, photo, uh, picture there, depiction of, the, I guess, the Jewish temple that they want to build. With the uh, wall, curtain wall around it. It kind of patterned after the old tabernacle in the wilderness. Um, a recent video from the Temple Institute concluded unequivocally that the Third Temple will not simply descend from heaven. And, you know, we talked about this, I think, a month ago, that video. Why don't Jews begin building today? The man in charge of organizing the Third Temple construction thinks he knows what it will take to jumpstart the process. Last week, the Temple Institute released a second video in their Holy Temple Mythbusters series. So maybe I didn't see that one. Maybe I saw the first one. So, well, maybe we'll check that out next week or if I can queue it up. Uh, but if you have the, if you're on the Temple Institute on on YouTube, you can watch that later. We usually don't learn a whole lot, except maybe some inferences from uh, watching their videos. But we, we like to keep an eye on things going on over there, because that'll be, it'll be, they got, what, what do they call this? Uh, oh, Temple Mythbusters. Uh, well, we're Rapture Busters here, okay? Um, and that's why it's so important to keep our eye, because when they, when they start to build this temple, no one's Rapture. Well, the Rapture Busters, that's us. Um, we'll have our job cut out for us because there'll be a lot of disillusioned people ready to jump to the mid-tribulation or post-tribulation position. And the first jump into rapture busting is when people uh, begin to conceive that there's no such thing as a pre-tribulation rapture. So they just move to one of the other positions, likely the post-tribulation, but without realizing that the entire seven-year tribulation is a deception. It's not scriptural at all. Okay. So, and yeah, read my books. Uh, the rapture will be canceled and when the third temple is built and, uh, with all of that will be clarified for you. And I suggest that you read both of them. Like I said, they're free. Free e-copy is online. Just go to my website and follow the instructions on the free ebook tab. Okay. Um, using rabbinic methodology, Rabbi Reichman said that the, said that it is a biblical commandment to build a temple as clearly stated in the Bible and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. <laughs> That's a little out of context because the sanctuary that they made was the, the, the tabernacle of the wilderness. 
Okay, the temple didn't come along for a long, long time uh, thereafter, not until Solomon became king. Uh, okay, and uh, we talk about, I talk about that in my uh, book here. It looks like they have the video right here. I don't know, should we play it or not? Okay, they got lots of commercials over here on the right. Uh, pay no attention to the commercials. <laughs> Okay, like any command, it is incumbent upon Jews to perform it themselves and not wait for God to perform it for them. Well, that's, that's a good principle. Rabbi Reichman's <clears throat> conclusion is a challenge to those who maintain that the third temple will descend from heaven, but is a strong vote of confidence for those who advocate Jews move forward in this endeavor. Where, where did the Jews get this idea that the temple would ascend from heaven? Um, I, I know in the Revelation we have we have the New Jerusalem descending from heaven, uh, but I don't think that's a you know that's not a Jewish book unless you actually accept Jesus as the Messiah, and then the whole New Testament becomes part of your testament. Okay, but anyway, third uh, okay as the chairman of the Temple Movement, Yaakov Haman is organizing the controversial efforts towards building the Third Temple. By profession, Haman manages building projects, and uh, this is the practical way he perceives the Third Temple, a construction project accomplished in stages. He describes a conflict between the two opinions, the temple coming down from heaven versus man-initiated construction, as evolution versus revolution. Well, whatever. I don't believe the temple will suddenly appear, Haman told Breaking Israel News. It needs to be a steady evolutionary process. And yes, it is evolving. One day it will, they'll start building it. Haman believes the first stage is that process, uh, in that process is within reach. What we need now is for more Jews to go up to the Temple Mount, Haman urged. When that happens, when thousands of Jews start going up to the Mount every day, like what happens, in Kotel, Western Wall, praying will just naturally happen. No one can stop that. It's a natural evolution from where we are now to where we need to build the temple. Both Rabbi Reichman and Haman believe in man-initiated construction, but with God playing an integral part in that process. And well, that would be historical too, because you know uh, that was the tabernacle in the wilderness and the, the previous two temples that were destroyed, uh, were man-initiated, but with God played an integral part in the process. At least, you know, they're kind of biblically sound there. Uh, at least Old Testament or Torah biblically sound. Uh, Rabbi Reichman cited the prophet Zechariah who stated that God himself will remedy the destruction of the second temple by building the third, by building the temple with fire. Oh, okay, well, I don't quite get that, but we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get back from these messages. You're listening uh, to Cross the Border, our Prophecy Reality Edition. We'll be back in a few minutes. Don't go anywhere. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the rapture will be canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, 
and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left-behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Welcome back. You're listening to Cross the Border. This is our Prophecy Reality News Edition. And when we left, we were talking about some things in the news. Um, we were looking at a uh, BreakingIsraelNews.com article. How the Third Temple is being built today. We left off, uh, we were reading a quote from uh, uh, Rabbi Reichman and uh, Haman believe that man initiated construction, but with God playing an integral part in the process, Rabbi Reichman um, cited as a cited the prophet Zechariah, who stated that God Himself will remedy the destruction of the second temple by building the third temp by building the temple with fire, the third temple with fire. Uh, for I for I saith for I saith Hashem, uh, or thus saith the Lord, uh, will be to her a wall of fire round about, and I will be the glory in the midst of her. This, this is their Israel version of the Bible, of the Torah, I guess. Uh, I'm sure that the Israel Bible doesn't have a, a New Testament in it. <laughs> Pretty sure of it, especially these guys. Uh, okay, Rabbi Reichman understands this to mean that God will be part of the process, but in no way exempts man from taking, part, taking a proactive role. To illustrate the point, Rabbi Reichman gave his powerful example of man's action, bringing about the divine will in 1967, Israel faced a vastly superior collection of enemy forces bent on destroying the Jewish state and defeated them. Rabbi Reichman uh, described this miraculous victory as analogous to God sending down fire to light the wood on the altar in the temple. And you know, I talk about that a little bit in my book, um, When the Third Temple, in the first chapter of When the Third Temple was built, I, I uh, noticed this 67 more. And I, and you know, he brings it up, but he should hide his face in shame because why did they not go in there and bring in some bulldozers and completely level all of those idolatrous Islamic edifices on the Temple Mount in 1967? But no, they didn't do that. I talked about that a little bit in my, in my book when the temple was, uh, when the third temple was built and it's in the third, first chapter. So you want to get a line on that, but ask yourself that question. But analogous, yes. So what he says is we, we need another miraculous event to happen where God absolutely intervenes, okay? And uh, so I guess what he's expecting, perhaps a, uh, you know, something to, some natural event, maybe a huge tornado or something to destroy those edifices or something. I, I don't know. But something by God to initiate it. And uh, so... Let's see. Uh, okay. When the, when applied to the third temple, Rabbi Reichman sees it as, as any other Torah commandment incumbent upon the Jews. First, Israel must fulfill God's commandment and build it themselves. And only afterward, God brings about the final spiritual torches or touches, uh, onto the structure that they have created in their own hands with the resting of the Shekinah, God's presence, Rabbi Reichman concluded. Haman warned that the building this built that building the structure is not the end of that process. Unlike the first, unlike the first two temples, the third temple will be eternal. Haman says there has to be a divine element added <clears throat> at the end to make it so. Hmm. I wonder if those guys who built the first and the second temple thought they would be eternal. Hmm. Interesting. Hyman believes that the Jews who object to constructing a temple do so in order to advance a political agenda and not for religious reasons, even if they claim religious motivations. There's a political agenda, 
not, to not build a temple, but there's no question about what the Torah, Torah commands, and that's that. You know, there's the there's the article there at Breaking Israel News, and I'll put a link at the bottom of this video uh, for anyone who wants to read that. And I have another one here, and uh, this one you might find a little more interesting too. Um, another one: Christians supporting Jerusalem Embassy could help bring third temple pastor. And I wonder who that pastor was. Same author, same Israel author, looking to the uh, the the Jewish worshiping evangelicals to help them build the temple. Because a lot of these a lot of these Christians they idolize Jews, and it's kind of sad because Jews. Are, I mean, I'm not. I'm not anti-Semitic. I don't hate Jewish people or any nationality. I, I believe if you're truly one of God's people, you cannot hate somebody just because of their nationality. Okay? You cannot hate someone because of their nationality. That is absolutely wrong. But you don't raise a nationality up, put them on a pedestal and practically worship them. Uh, most of the, most of these Israel's today, people in Israel today, these Yahudi in Israel, most of them are lost sinners, um, lost in their sin, and they need the Messiah. They need to be saved by the blood of the Lamb. That's what they need. And a lot of them have been. Okay? And, and all of the fathers of our faith, uh, that wrote the New Testament, the majority of them, yes, were National Jews. That's right. So we cannot be anti-Semitic. But anyway, Christians supporting Jerusalem Italy could help bring a third temple pastor. And of course, um, more in a move, one prominent pastor believes will be the first step towards building the third temple. Jews and Christians are coming together in a project to give President Donald Trump major support for moving the U.S. Tr embassy to Jerusalem. And he's already said he would do that. So they, they think that's one step towards getting the, uh, the temple built. Okay. And so, uh, you got Rabbi Weiss of Israel 365, um, the Jewish. Okay. Well, I don't know what that's all about. Um, let's see. Oh yeah. Here's, here's your ma prominent pastor, uh, Pastor Begley. <laughs> Pastor Begley, you know, are you serious, guy? Well, I, you know, I've watched a few of his videos. I stopped watching because he is a futurist. He is, he is under the delusion. And, you know, I don't think he's a Jesuit coadjutor. He may be, I don't know, don't really care. You know, I'm commanded to believe the best about people. So I will believe the best until I understand that my belief cannot be substantiated by the facts because the facts are contrary to what I believe is the best. That these people are seriously deluded. They believe in a seven year tribulation deception. And so anyway, I'm going to probably watch this video later and see what Begley says, um, with, with Mr. Glick, the Jewish guy and Pastor Begley. I mean, that's how you get to be big and gets lots of money and you write books and they sell millions of copies. First, you gotta be a futurist. You got, you gotta believe in the seven year rapture, tribulation, deception, and you have to sell it. You have to be a salesman for it. Then you're allowed by those in charge of mainstream Christian media and publishing and all that. You are allowed, uh, to become prominent in the eye of the outer court, the Gentiles, the, you see, cause the outer court is, uh, you know, go back to your revelation and the temple scenes, and it's really a scene of the church. Very few in the inner court, but you want to be popular, you got to be in the outer court, and you got to be big in the outer court, and that's where these guys are big at, because they're doing what those that control the outer court, and mainly the Antichrist. He's got the biggest position in the outer court of the, the temple scene in Revelation of anybody. So these guys are big in the outer court. I can't, you know... Uh, I, you know, I kind of poke and prod at the outer court, but I'm overwhelmed by all of the biggies out there making all the big bucks. And, uh, but that's okay. You know, I've already made my commitment to the Almighty that I would rather be poor. I would rather live in want than forget his benefits. There you go.
All right, so go on down here and see. And anyway, so there's that article there, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about it, but you kind of get the idea. They they just want to see it moved, and and uh, of course there was the Jerusalem Assembly, no Jerusalem uh, Assembly. What do they call it? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, moving the. Well, I forgot that word. Oh yeah, the the embassy assembly. Yeah, got my words mixed up there. Sounds like. Anyway, moving the Jerusalem, the the American embassy to Jerusalem, they think that that will help uh, in the effort to get the temple built. And so you can see this is this is really building up a lot of steam here. Uh, Trump has already uh, committed himself to enforcing the Embassy Act, was, which was passed by Congress back in the 1990s. That's right. The, the, uh, the, the act to move the, the embassy to Jerusalem was passed in the 1990s. So uh, Trump is going to uphold the law and make them move it. That's, at least that's his idea. So it's likely to happen. And uh, I said, bring it on. Let's, let's get this show on the road. <laughs> you know, I'm ready for it. And then we can disabuse all of those poor, disillusioned, uh, ra- seven-year tribulation rapturous once they start building this temple and nobody's raptured. Sorry. Not even the Antichrist can pull off that. But he doesn't want to. He wants them disillusioned. That's why Ribera, that's why they built on the foundation that the Jesuit Ribera left 500 years ago when he developed the end-time Antichrist scenario to take the onus off of the biblical and historical Antichrist, the seed of the papacy. That's what it's all about. And you have all of these men that are just falling in line, and like Begley and, and uh, a lot, even a lot of Bible teachers that I really look up to because they're so sound on the gospel and Bible teaching. But when it comes to prophecy man they just they throw out all of their sound uh biblical interpretive methods go right out the window i mean it just it blows my mind i I don't know how they can do it (laughs) so anyway uh, when they start to build this temple we'll have a better chance of disabusing them and i'm hoping that this book will help then that maybe maybe it can sell you know, a million copies of this book when that happens. But it's ready. You know, God gave it to me. I published it. It's ready. And the time is right. So uh, looking forward to that. Let's see. What else do I have for you? That's, that's about all I have to say about those things in the news. And I have an email, and I shared this email on my website. So let me find that. If I go to my homepage, and, and if... You subscribe to my blog. You got a link in your email to this because I sent it out yesterday or the day before. I can't remember which, but this is from, um, from Billy. And I'm not sure. I don't even know if I, oh yes, he has subscribed to me because I've sent him my book and that's what he was writing me about. And is he in the chat room? Billy, if you're in the chat room, kind of say something there, but I don't know if you are or not because I can't remember your name in the chat room. I think it's Lizzie Sack on YouTube. is Billy's moniker on YouTube. So, and I see him over there a lot on YouTube. But anyway, let's check it out. And the, the name of this uh, is, uh, I, I named this post, Who Has Ears to Hear? And I quote this uh, verse here. He that hath an ear to hear He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And I thought it was a fitting uh, revelation verse because I received this email from a listener, one who gets it. He has an ear to hear. Okay? And he writes to me. I better open up the, uh, the whole thing there. He says, Nicholas, I have completed reading the rapture will be canceled it is very good the chapters go by rather fast 
once getting into it. I think all activists that are protesting the state of Israel should read this book. It is a must, I think. And they should also read Barry Chamish's work. I learned much the last couple months from watching Prophecy Reality, FA and First Amendment Radio on YouTube, starting to discern more hatred towards Israel, the Jews, and we, I talked a little bit of more, a little bit about anti-Semitism uh, earlier in the broadcast, and that's what he's referring to: people who hate the Jews, and they're all over the internet. Some some people have broadcasts, and they're they're all broadcasts as the Jews are the bad, and you know the Jews are building the new one or on the Jews run the money and uh, and all that stuff and the Jews and you know whatever and everything that goes wrong is blamed on the Jews no that's not right you know this uh unnatural hatred toward the the Jews or any race of people is forbidden by scripture uh and the reverence of them from the American evangelicals. So, so you have two extremes there. Those that worship the Jews and those that, that hate them. Well, let's just put the Jews on par with everyone else and we're good. Okay? Because that's all they are. They're not to be worshipped. They're not to be hated any more than anyone else. Okay? So thank you for that, Billy. So Billy does get it so far. And... uh I'm still a rather I'm still rather new to understanding all of this, but your book and listening to prophecy reality, well, I feel foolish over previous thoughts, opinions. It has helped me to fine tune my understanding. I have also listened to Tom Fress, and it's very clear that the rapture is false, a deception, that the Antichrist has always been the papacy. There's a rumor that Chuck Missler is a Freemason, and I heard the following quote from an old William Cooper Hour of the Times broadcast. And here's the quote. Quote, because in my research I have found that most of the theologians in the Protestant religion of all denominations who were responsible for this doctrine of the rapture are Freemasons and they are in control of the World Council of Churches. They are responsible for bringing together of the different religions of the World Council of Churches to attempt to merge them all into one and then cha change the doctrine to the new world religion. I could almost hear, unquote, I could almost hear Bill Cooper in my own voice there. Wow, kind of spooky. <laughs> but I love Bill Cooper. We, I used to have him on my network back in the 90s. And uh, that was before he was gunned down in his driveway going out to get his mail. Imagine that, going out to get your mail and being gunned down by federal, or was it federal? I think it was county agent that got him down, but whatever. Not cool, dude. He was murdered in his driveway for whatever reason. Okay, anyway, let's continue. So he puts that quote in there from uh, Hour of the Time and uh, William Cooper. Um, while reading your book, I came to the conclusion that in a nutshell... Zionism is Jesuit futurism. <laughs> yes, you nailed it. That, that's it in a nutshell. He says, uh, I'm not sure if this is a correct conclusion, but in a nutshell, that's a very good conclusion, Billy. Then things started to add up when I was close to finishing reading your book. I liked how you referenced Barry Chamish in the first chapters. I understand that there are problems with Eric Phelps, but between reading Vatican Assassins and the completion of reading your book, it seems that the modern state of Israel was designed to corral, to destabilize the Mideast, to ultimately set the stage for the one world religion. I think you said it, that it was to get all the Protestants that are falling for the rapture to have them accept Catholicism when the rapture doesn't come to pass. Yes, that's in my book. In other words, in the words of Billy there, say, Billy does get it. And I think part of the tactic behind it is to make biblical Christianity look ridiculous. See, the Antichrist has always hated the Bible. Anything to make, to get you away from looking, picking up God's word and reading it for yourself. Anything but that, you know, anything but what's filtered through the Catholic Church. Yes. Enter clergy. 
And I think part of the you know, make it okay, make biblical Christianity look religious, debating rapture doctrine, dueling scriptures, just like many are doing with the idiotic flat earth revival. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Billy, for that. We'll continue. This is a great letter. That's why I had to post it as a post. As I've said, I'm new to all of this, including Bible study, and I think you're probably the best in Bible ministry. I really like the key to the apocalypse videos. When you brought up the Sabbath, that the churches have it wrong, it's, it's good to know. I was ignorant thinking SDAs were correct. A lot of people do. They are very good at quoting Rome, changing a Sabbath day to Sunday, but they are both fighting over Roman calendar days and thinking that Saturday is the true Sabbath. It is still rendering to Caesar what is God's. Amen. That's my amen. It's really absurd to proclaim that Saturday is the true Sabbath when it's a day assigned on a Roman solar calendar named after a pagan deity. I was dumbfounded when I realized how ridiculous the Sabbath debate is. It's lunar-based, and the Sabbath became Jesus when he resurrected, that the day would matter not to him because he is the Savior. The Sabbath, if I understand correctly, and yes, you get it. You know, I've got a post out there, and uh, if you read the post and you read what I've written, you, you understand what the scripture says, the lunar-based Sabbath that, is, that was given to the children of Israel in the wilderness and the exodus, and uh, you come to the conclusion that we're to walk in liberty Christ demonstrated walking in liberty as a Sabbath, but, you know, we should apply a Sabbath principle to our life. We should take one day and seven off and, and commit it to the Lord. But actually, truly, because He is our Sabbath rest, we should commit every day to Him while employing a principle of one day rest and seven. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter a walk in liberty. It doesn't matter what day it is. It really doesn't. So you got it. You nailed it. You know, Billy gets it. Okay? A shame that so many people are caught up in this rapture deception, he continues. Freemasons subverting Protestant churches and to a 15th century Jesuit doctrine. Yes, from the Jesuit Ribera, the end time antichrist doctrine. The more I think about it, I probably should unsubscribe from channels that insist on pushing the deception. There's some informative channels on YouTube that expose the Jesuits, but then insist on pushing the rapture as truth. At this point, I think they know what they are doing, but they're, they're slick at deception. I think I did hear in an Eric John Phelps interview that he said something like, if dispensationalism is Jesuit doctrine, so be it type of attitude. It seems on channels like Paul Bagley, and that was, uh, that was kind of what they call a kismet that I opened up that Jewish article. There's Paul Bagley on it, uh, after getting this email. Totally unrelated, but there it is, related. Hordes of people are crying out for the rapture. It's sad. And these guys make a ton of money. And these people that are waiting for the rapture could be a lot of help to others. I want to do this kind of stuff, research, and inform people to the truth. And it's hard. I've been into researching the Vatican New World Order for a year now and didn't dive into the Bible much until the last few months. I'm up to the book of Job now and the Geneva Bible, but these people have been Christians all their lives. There are so many people in this world, so many activists that don't know the truth, and these Christians could be witnessing to them. The rapture nonsense more than likely turns a lot of people away when they see Christians in a scripture battle over the rapture, over the flat earth. Anyways, I apologize for typing so much. I'll get around to reading Hori Apocalyptica. I would like to read the upcoming book you are about to release. Thanks again for your awesome ministry, Billy. And uh, I'm grateful for that, and I'm uh, glad that I got to share that letter um, uh, from my that I posted on my blog, Who Has Ears to Hear? And so God's going to be opening up the ears of a lot of his elect. So we need all the workers we can get here. And uh, if you'd like to help me out or 
you'd like to help distribute my books, get in contact with me. We'll make sure you get them at cost. And uh, let's get the word out. When the third temple is built, the rapture play will begin. Okay, we'll be back in a few minutes. Don't go anywhere. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Cross the Border. This is our Prophecy Reality Edition. It looks like I took a little too long of a break there. I think we're going to jump into our topic of the day and we're going to kick some things around. Like I said, I'm looking at elements of prophecy to understanding prophecy. And I had these questions here. And the questions, uh, when to apply the day-year theory and when not to apply it? That's a good question. And oh, should, I should have my scriptures all outlined here, but I do not. <laughs> yes, indeed, I do not. So what am I looking for here? Um, well, I guess we're just going to have to talk about it and see what we come up with as far as the day-year theory. Now, there are several time periods given in the scripture that... Uh, that people apply the day-year theory to, and uh, why? W what makes what makes the difference? Where do you apply a day-year theory, and where where do you not? Now, I've come to the conclusion that not all of the time periods given in the scripture as days are actual years. Uh, for instance, in in Daniel, they sh they talk about uh, Daniel talks about a twenty-three hundred Days. There's a 2300 days prophecy in Daniel. He also brings up, um, 1290 days and then, but not 1260, it's 1290 
and then it says then there's a two thousand. Uh, what is it exactly? And I guess I would have to open up Daniel to look at that. So let's do that. That's that's what we're doing right now. We're just kind of looking at these things. And if anyone wants to wants to join me or has anything to say about that, like I said, you go to firstamendmentradio.com. There's a phone number in the upper left hand corner. You can call in right now and you can come on the air with me. I've got the phone device standing by to take your call or in the upper right hand corner of the chat room. And I wanted to go to Daniel. So let me, I think it was Daniel chapter 12 that will find several of these mentions. And I want to look at those and I don't want to understand them right now. I just want to look at the elements of these. Okay. Um, okay. Let me, let me see if I can put that on the screen desktop. Oh yeah. Look at right there. And maybe get that centered there and put it on the screen. Okay. Transition to a Bible on screen and, uh, 12, four, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. And, um, let's see, where are these time sequences? Okay. And here at the very end, uh, he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Well, we are absolutely in the time of the end right now. I think so. Yeah. We're getting very close to the time of the end. Whether this is the time of the end uh, the, of Daniel, the, the 70 weeks of Daniel, well, I know it's the time of the end of the 70 weeks of Daniel. That time closed in the first century. I know that the 70th week and I got another email. Maybe I'll have to look at that. We'll discuss that a little bit from a, a listener. And I, just to show you how people buy into this delusion. Uh, many shall be purified, made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And there's a lot of wicked people in the outer court of our temple scene in Revelation. Okay? A lot of wicked people in the outer court. Um, that, that is reserved for the Gentiles. They are, they are pretend Christians. They're Christian in name only. That's what the outer court or the court of the Gentiles is for in the, in the temple scene in the book of Revelation. Okay. Uh, he says, but bless, uh, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Hmm. Okay. So now we have a thousand two hundred and ninety days. There's your twelve hundred and ninety days from Daniel chapter twelve. And he says, From the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up. What is he talking about? Is that a thousand two hundred and ninety years? Okay, we have a starting point here. Starting point is from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. Wasn't this when Jesus in the midst of the 70th week? See, and that's this, this time period is only named once in the scripture. So we're looking at elements of this. This time period is only named once in the scripture. And it doesn't seem to be any relation to the 1260 days, but it's 1290 days. And in my book and uh, the rapture will be canceled. I did cover the, uncover this. I, I did tell you what I thought that it was actually literal. And the reason that I believe these are literal days, and not a year for a day is because this is the only mention of it. And it is only mentioned as days. And there's nothing in the text to say it will be a year for a day. Now, if you go to, um, we have another prophecy that I believe it is Ezekiel. And where was that Ezekiel? where he was told to lay on his side for so many days, I think three, 380 days on one side and then 40 days on the other side. But it says in the prophecy, in the text, it says a year for a day. A year was symbolic for a day. I mean, a day was that he laid on his side was symbolic for a year in Israel or Judah, depending on which side he was laying on. But it was explicitly expressed in the text that it was a year for a day. Do we have license from that to blanket it and say that it's all 
that anywhere a day is used in prophecy, it's a year. I don't think so. I think we have a rule there that if it is explicitly stated, then it is a year for a day. And if it's not, well, then we have to consider that it may be a day for a day and not a year for a day. Or that it may be either, but we need an evidence or another witness to convert it. That's, that's my, that's what I believe. Okay? So, that's the element of days. And he says, from the time that the daily sacrifice was taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate is set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now, how I, on the day for a day theory, this works. Okay? On a day for a day theory, this works from the time that Jesus took the daily sacrifice by sacrificing himself. Okay? And of course, the abomination that maketh desolate was set up because every sacrifice they made for sins after Jesus Sacrifice himself for sin was an abomination. There shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days, a day for a day. Not representative, but actual days. And what does this mean? To me, if I apply this a day for a day from the midst of the 70th week of Daniel when Jesus uh, sacrificed himself for sin and the daily sacrifice was taken away by that sacrifice, 1,290 days later, the 70 weeks ended. Yeah. Because one of those years had an additional month of Adar in it. Historical fact. Going back to the lunar calendar. If you don't understand that, then you don't understand the second Adar. But you can look up second Adar on your Google engine and you can quickly discover what second Adar means. It's a second, it's a 13th month they would just have a second Adar. And some people might ask, well, what do you do if you were born your birthday or you had an anniversary in second Adar? Well, you would celebrate it in first Adar the next year because there wouldn't be a second Adar. Only seven of 19 years had a second Adar to follow the calendar that God gave the Hebrew people in the wilderness, in the Exodus. And my posting on that, if you're interested in to learn more about that, is what month is it? That's M-O-O-N-T-H. What month is it? So you can read about that. And the Sabbath uh, concerns that were addressed in uh, Billy's letter, which I read in the last segment here. Okay, so, and Daniel said, Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. What happened 1,305 and 30 days at later? So that's 40, 45 days later? What happened? Something happened 45 days later. Well, I'm going to tell you what I think happened. I think the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentile churches and they were converted to true Israel. That's what I think. I think the church became one on that day. That's right. The National Church of Israel the true believers, the true Yahudi, not those who say they are Yahudi but are not, or those who call themselves that are, are that call themselves Jews but are not from the Revelation. I think a correct interpretation of that would be those who call themselves Yahudi, the people of God, but are not. That would be like the Catholic Church, the Pope, and all of those. And, oh, you can go to. Um, Mormons, and Jehovah's Witnesses, and, and 10,000 other denominations out there that call themselves Jews but are not. Okay, they call themselves Yahudi, the people called by his name, but they are not true. Okay? So blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. Okay? So you have to go from, now the futurists put this, they use literal days, but they go from the middle of the juxtaposed futurist 70th week of Daniel, seven year tribulation, 70th week of Daniel. Wrong too. Okay. Okay. So elements of prophecy. When is a year, when does a day for a year apply? When does it not? And okay? so we have that there. Let's see. What else do we got? What other, um, any comments? Anything going on in the chat room there? Let me see, more difficult ones to take care of your needs. Oh, they're having a different conversation in the chat room. 
I think I need to give James his own show. <laughs> Let me know when you're ready, James. Uh, I think I can trust you, man. Uh, anyway, that way you won't have to do a show during my show in the chat room. Yeah, how about that? I'd like to think you were at least listening and talking about what I'm talking about. And uh, no, he's got something else going here. Why is it easier for a poor man in the East to accept Christ than for any person in the West? Uh, well, with God, all things are possible. That I know. But Jesus already had that conversation with Peter. I read it in the Gospels. Okay, now back to prophecy reality. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Okay, our next time period that we we need to look at was, I was looking at the 2300, and that's from, from um, go back to our Bible here. That's back, that goes back to um, Daniel chapter 8. Okay, and I've got the whole vision here. Okay, and uh, this is it here. Okay. Then I heard one saint speaking to another saint, uh, Speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Whew, what a question, man. And he said to me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Okay, here we are. Now, this is... This is a conversation. This was that took place in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar of Babylon. Okay, a vision appeared unto me. Daniel says, even unto me, Daniel, and after that which appeared unto me at the first. So he's referencing his first vision. This is a second vision that he had, and he tells you what you saw in the vision. And here's the vision of the three beasts. Okay. I lifted up my eyes and, and I, I referenced this a ram which had two horns and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other and came up last. No, this is not the three beasts. That's chapter seven. And I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, southward so that no beast might stand before him so that no beast. And that gets to our element of beasts. So we got to look at all of these beasts to find out what is a beast so we don't confuse it like in the chapter 17 riddle of the seven kings. They are identified in the riddle. It's a two verse riddle. They are identified in the riddle as beasts. So they can't be the Jesuits. They can't be the papacy as opposed to the previous uh, emperors, which was Constantine and what who were Justinian and, and all of the Roman emperors or the pagan emperors. They can't be one because they're on, it's the same beast. So. We have to identify what a beast is. How does a beast rise? What makes a power in the earth qualify as a beast? That's the other element. And all of these come into play. But we're still looking at times, okay? And I was considering, uh, and behold, a go. And, and of course, this is the Medo-Persia Empire. One horn is higher than the other, the ram pushing westward that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any could deliver out his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. I believe that's the uh, Medo-Persia empire. And as considering, behold, a goat, a goat came from the west and his face on the face of the whole earth, he touched not the ground and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns which I had seen standing before the river and, and, and ran into him with the fury of his power. And I saw him come close to the ram and he was moved with choler against him and smote the ram and break his two horns and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. So you get the ram with two horns, one higher than the other, the Medo-Persian Empire. Therefore the goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, that's Alexander the Great, and for it came up four notable horns, one toward the four uh, one, notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And of course Alexander's kingdom, because he had no heir, uh, went to his four generals. And this is all. And out of the one came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the north, 
toward the south, toward the east, toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great, it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And he came down and he cast down some of the hosts of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, magnify himself to the prince of the hosts, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And a host was given to him against the daily sacrifice by reason of the transgression, and cast down the truth to the ground, and practice prospered. Okay, so. And I heard one saint speaking to another saint, said to that certain saint, we speak, how long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the transgression of desolation, to give both sanctuary to the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said to me, unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. A lot of people think this is twenty three hundred years. And, and then there's a debate when it starts. So let's see, the SDAs, they started at the same time that the 70 weeks prophecy starts. But where do they get that in the text? Well, they don't, because 70 weeks prophecy doesn't come until the next chapter in a different uh, vision, a different revelation that Daniel has. It's not the same one. Um, some people say, well, it starts here. It starts in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, and that takes you to about, to about 1800, 1844, or something like that. What happened in 1844, 2300 years from the date that this prophecy was given? Well, practically nothing. The, the SDAs, they had to conclude that, well, the sanctuary is cleansed in heaven because it's not on earth. So therefore, and they came up with their cleansing of the sanctuary doctrine. Jesus didn't quite finish it on the cross. He's now finishing it by cleansing the temple in heaven. What? Nonsense. Okay, well, that was from their prophet, uh, what's her name, Alan G. White. Okay, so the 2300 days prophecy, what is that about? Well, either it ends, and I have to go with an ending date on it, because it references an end there. It says the cleansing of the temple, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Well, when was the sanctuary cleansed? Hmm. Well, the, the sanctuary was cleansed after this prophecy when the second temple was built. So we have to select a termination date of an actual cleansing of the sanctuary because this isn't Revelation, this is Daniel. <clears throat> and this is concerning his people and the daily sacrifice. So before the daily sacrifice could take place, you go to Ezra chapter 6, and they had to, they had a cleansing ritual of cleansing of the temple. And so if we postate that 2300 literal days, it's like six point whatever years, I think. So yeah, six point, six and a third years or something like that, approximately. So if we postate that, then we would have a, a starting date from the date of the cleansing of the temple when the second temple was built after this prophecy was given of 2300 days and I never could put it together I could never could make it work so how long to be trodden underfoot but it seems to be the only place it fits unless you can apply it to the cleansing of the temple that Jesus did when he drove the money changers out of the temple what happened 2300 days prior to that you know, and I have not tried to solve this mystery yet. I'm still, I kick things around for years before I settle on it. So I have these two cleansing of the temple dates that are given in the scripture, and I'm looking for a post date, 2300 days it fits. But I don't think it's years, because years works nowhere. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get back. Visit crosstheborder.org C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. 
Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back. You're listening to Cross the Border, a Prophecy Reality Edition, and glad to see that so many people are catching up with me in the chat room and actually uh, joining the discussion there. Um, yeah, I would consider that Geneva note there, Thomas, or WW in the chat room. And uh, let's see. And I'm not sure that the little horn is the Antichrist, but I would go with uh, primarily that Daniel's prophecies, I would say, are primarily national Jewish and considering the national Jewish people, of course, they all have allusions to the to the fu to the future beyond Israel and the end of time and the judgment of the living and the dead and the resurrection, because th that's the ultimate hope of even national Israel, is uh, what would come after Christ. But Daniel's prophecies are primarily national and Jewish and should be applied there where they can be applied there historically. Yeah, that's right. And so with most of the Old Testament prophets should be applied thus. Although many of them in their prophecies, there's, they trail off beyond. And of course they have to because it's there. It's the great hope. Jesus, Yahshua, the Messiah, uh, is the great hope. And the great hope that we have now was their great hope too. So of course their prophecies have to trail off, but the primary emphasis and the primary body of their prophecy is that period of national Israel, which ended uh, at the 70 weeks. And it ended with a um, the time of Jacob's trouble, which finally was concluded in 70 AD, when the nation and the temple and the, the state was annihilated and whoever lived was taken captive. Uh, and sold into slavery by the Romans, uh, who they didn't kill, and they killed a lot of people in that in their final solution, okay, which was really God's judgment on national Israel. I talk about that in both of my books. Okay, so we're getting some things here on the the twenty three hundred days, and so there's the whole twenty three hundred days. I don't believe it's years anywhere. 
I'm sorry, there's nothing in the text. It's a, it's a, a morning and the, and the morning and the evening and the morning were a day. That's our, we get that from Genesis, the jet, the, the creation account. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And when it says an evening and a morning, we have to turn to the scripture and say that's a day is a day is a day. And that's it. Okay. In none of a, we're going to go to next is a 1260 days prophecy. Why is that different? Why would I say, I know that's 1260 years when all the rest of them are days for the most part, unless they say they're years, as in the Ezekiel prophecy where he laid on one side what was 380 days. And boy, that must have been hard being a prophet for God, having to lay on one side for 380 days and on the other side for 40 days. And they, and each day represented a year. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So now we have the, the 1260 days. And why is that a year for day? Why do I believe that's different? Because it's the same time period is given in three different references in three different ways. One is 1260 days. The other is 42 months. And the other is a time. A time is a year from the scripture itself. <clears throat> So a time times and half a time, that's three and a half years, 360 days or 42 months, all the same period of time given, all overlapping in the revelation, letting you know one thing because of the inconsistency of the way that the periods are given and that they all apply to the same period of time that the way they're giving it given is definitely symbolic to represent a 300 i mean to, to represent a 1260 actual years so it's they're symbolic and that's what i would say to, in defense of the year for a day for that period but a year for a day theory cannot be applied with a blanket application to every prophecy that's given in the scripture referencing a uh, enumerated days like the 2300, 2300 days or the 1290 days or 2100 or 2035 days, whatever it is from Daniel 10. And whatever, what other time frame uh, references do we have that we haven't referenced already, but those. Ah. The Daniel 70 weeks. And I see this, you know, I've, I've read just, uh, and I'm reading everything I can on Protestant historicism. And I believe that it's an error that they've made. They're just men, you know, while they have a lot of it right, but I think a, a, a blanket application of a day year for all these prophecies is wrong. I think every one needs to be taken and considered individually. And if it says it's a day for a year, as it does in one case, then that's what it is. And if it says it's, uh, it says days, morning and evenings, then I believe they're morning and evenings. Yes, as defined by the scripture and especially say Genesis, the evening and the morning were the first day, the evening, every day for a day, for a 24 hour day, an actual solar day, whatever you want to call it, an evening and a morning was a day that they're actual days. But we have, we have an indication from the revelation that those three time periods, 1260 days, 42 months, time, time, and half times, all referencing the same period of time, that those are symbolic for 1260 years. And we have history to back it up. Yeah. That's, that's a slam dunk for me. Yeah. Of course, the futurists will want to put that out into the, same into the seven year tribulation deception by juxtaposing Daniel's 70th week. But now the problem with that is that the futurists have a problem with that. And I have, uh, uh, have written both of my books, The Rapture Will Be Canceled and The When the Third Temple is Built. And I cover different aspects of the fallacy of the seven year tribulation and the fallacy of their rendering of Daniel's 70th week. I just build upon it more. It's more, <clears throat> it's more brick and mortar with 
with good mortar that will stand the test of time. It's in the, in the wall of truth prophecy because it's founded upon God's word. The only true prophecy out there is that which is completely revealed in God's word. Only by his word can we trust it. If otherwise, it's just speculation and conjecture. And that's basically what futurism, um, left behind, futurist, seven-year tribulation eschatology is built upon. Okay, so we're going to talk about many of the few of the historicists and now see I'm going to even criticize historicists okay they <clears throat> they they bolster their day year theory upon the Daniel 70 weeks prophecy they say the Daniel 70 weeks prophecy was a day for a year therefore they use that as as uh as proof as proof text or as a witness to their day year theory but there's a problem with that now if we go to daniel chapter 9 which i'm going to bring up here and i'm going to show you what the problem with that is you cannot use daniel's 70 weeks the daniel 70 weeks prophecy to bolster a day year theory and the reason is in the text itself as opposed to what's in the text of the other ones you're trying to bolster it upon and if we go to daniel 9:24 where the, where the 70 weeks prophecy begins. I'll put it on the screen here. <coughs> Excuse me. Get a little liquid here. It's kind of, and uh, let me bring that down so everyone can read it. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, upon the holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision of prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now, here's the problem. I don't get a day for a year out of here because nowhere in, the prof in, in this prophecy does it say 490 years. That's a big problem. You cannot use what's not written in, this actual, in the actual text of the prophecy to bolster the day year theory because it's not here. It says 70 weeks are determined. <clears throat> and they say, well, a week is seven days, therefore it's 490 days, ergo 490 years. Sorry, this is God's word and God is giving it to us in the form he's giving it to us, not in the form you convert it to. No. Okay, so we go on and he talks and it says, it doesn't say days anywhere. <clears throat> Seventy weeks are determined. No further than understand. There shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Still no days, even in troublous times. And after the three score and two weeks, okay, so weeks, we don't, there's not a day mentioned in here anywhere. Not an evening and a morning mentioned anywhere. But these are weeks, okay? And he shall confirm the covenant with many for, for one week. Mm hmm. So the, the weeks are spread up into three segments there. Okay, so their problem. This does not bolster the day for your theory because there's no morning evenings, there's no days mentioned. So how are people to understand this? Okay, the same way that if I said, <clears throat> <clears throat> let's say I said to you, the time of Jacob's trouble lasted four decades. Would you think I was talking about 40 days, a literal days? Well, no, you instantly know that I was talking about a 40 year period, four decades, four periods of 10 years. Why? Why would you think that when I didn't say it? I said decades, okay? Which means tens, four tens, because we understand in our language and dealing with the Roman calendar that a decade is 10 years. So if I say four decades, you instantly understand 40 years, four 10 year periods. Okay. Now, if you were speaking, if you were back in the time of Daniel and you were speaking to the Hebrew, Hebrew people and you said septade, however, they would say, um, However, they say, they would say that in Hebrew, but I guess septade would be Greek, but that would be our equivalent of saying a seven year period. If I said, if I said 70 septades, then basically that's what's going on here in Daniel. These 70 weeks 
are 70 groupings of seven year periods where I mean, if Daniel, if, if we had an, uh, an English speaking prophet today speaking to the King James Bible people, and he would have said, uh, 49 decades instead of 70 septades or 70 weeks. That's all that's going on here. So it's crystal clear. And the Jewish people understand this even today that this, this, the 70 weeks refer to 70 seven year periods because that's what their cal calendar was based upon. It was based upon sevens because that was the calendar that God gave them in the wilderness. So the 70 weeks in no way verifies or confirms a day for a year theory. Throw it out, but it's used over and over again and repeated over and over by the historicists in their dot in their writing. They read it in, in, in E.B. Eliot's Hori Apocalyptica and H. Grattan Guinea's, uh, what is his, um, what's a history unveiling prophecy, things like that. And, but they're wrong. And they take this application and, and H. Grattan Guinea is just, he runs whole hog pedal to the metal with it. And I believe it leads to error. Sorry. I love these guys and, and the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the majority of the body, their work is very sound. But where they trail off into this and applying this to everything and then using Daniel 70 weeks to bolster it, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And this is part of uh, the elements of prophecy that we need to understand. So I'm going to be writing the elements of prophecy and talking about these time periods. When is a day uh, a day and when is a, a year a day? And I believe the scripture clearly spells it out. And we need to understand that when we apply it where God doesn't apply it, that it is speculation. Now, if we apply it where God applies it, and then we have history to back it up, we know we're on pretty sure ground as with the actual 1260 year period. Totally, you know, uh, obviously symbolic in the way that it's given in in the revelation and there's a lot of symbol symbolic uh, symbols in revelation and that's why it's good to have this little book and why i want to write the companion to it for these other elements of prophecy for a greater understanding but the key to the apocalypse and this is by h grattan guineas who runs whole hog pedal to the metal uh, with the day year theory and i believe uh goes off into some things that are not quite right there okay so yeah, like I said, I love these men, and we're going to have a lot of time uh, uh, when we get into the resurrection to spend together. But anyway, I've republished this, and I even added an addendum to it. And uh, I'm probably going to do another, like I said, another uh, or elements of prophecy as a companion work for uh, what the, the the major body of which great H. Grantan Guineas does there. Okay. So we talked about this time periods today, and um, let's see, what else do we have to do here? And uh, we're going to talk about what is a beast, uh, why, is, why does one beast have seven heads while all the other beasts have only one head? And we're, so we're going to talk about the beasts and all of that. What, what kind of interpretation, what kind of rules does God's Word lay out for us when it comes to that? And the chat and the Revelation 17, I've already covered that. That's in the uh, and you can find that article on my website. Let me see if I can find it on my website. If I can find it, you can find it. <laughs> yeah, so let's put it there. And if you go, let's see, Key to the Apocalypse. Uh, yeah, and, you know, I go through the entire Key to the Apocalypse on my website, and that would be. Um, on my website and I'm looking in these trending articles but let me go to my home page here oh I think I might be on my home page yes um, oh the addendum 2017 and I cover that that's the addendum that I wrote for this little pocket book here and I'll cover that cover or at least cover parts of it there um, and here it is interpreting the seven kings of Revelation 17 
Um, you definitely want to pay attention to that. We go through the two verses there, and uh, and I spell it out. That's that's like I said, that's in the book, um, and it's also in my uh, it's also a chapter in my latest book, which is uh, when when the third temple is built. You definitely want to get a hold of that. Okay. So, and any help you can give me on that. I like a lot of these ideas in the chat room. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to see them after the chat room closes. So if you have any ideas and you can email them to me, because I'd like to address them, because I figure if I can, you know, address people directly, then I have a better chance when I actually write my elements of prophecy of getting my idea across to uh, the actual people that are going to read it, uh, rather than how I conceive that people might receive it in my own mind because, you know, I'm just me. <laughs> I mean, I'm a man like everyone else, but sometimes I get, you know, like a lot of authors do, they, you get tunnel vision. You see what you see and you see it the way you see it and, and somehow you kind of think that people should get it, but the, you, they don't think exactly like you. So it's, it's kind of good to, to get a lot of input on it. And I have, uh, if anyone wants to call in, we got, we got, um, yes, mm. I'm checking out the chat room here. It says, my, uh, Mask, Maskadov, well, my friend believes he like his car. <laughs> Whatever that means, I don't, we need to give them the truth and preach them gospel. That's a good idea. Whatever you do, always preach the gospel. I think I missed the part about Daniel 11 and 12. Oh, yes. Do your show after mine, James? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Or call me and join me and we'll spend some time on the air and we can discuss whatever you want to discuss. Let's see. Anonymous says, SDA explaining 2300 days, four horns restrict freedom, four carpenters restore true worship. Woe to those that ease in Zion, flee Babylon. Huh? What? I don't know. I don't go with the SDA, uh, cleansing of the temple doctrine. I think it's heretical. I'm sorry. I call it the transubstantiation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That's what I call their cleansing of the temple doctrine. That's what it is. It's the transubstantiation because Jesus didn't quite finish the work. He had to appear and cleanse the temple again. Okay? No, he said it is finished on the cross. And believe me, when he said it's finished, it's finished. It's done. The work is done. Hallelujah, the work is done. Okay? So let's, uh, let's not make up stuff out of whole cloth because we need, because, because our great expectation failed. The great disappointment happened and they weren't raptured or resurrected on 1844. So they came up with an altar and, well, it didn't happen on earth. It happened in heaven. Well, that's great. What, what do we need a prophecy of something that's going to happen in heaven for? We're here on the earth. And I don't have a precedent in Scripture that God gives us a prophecy that's absolutely worthless to us uh, in our trek on, you know, terra firma here. Okay? All right. Yes. And, uh, yes, YouTube links after show. You guys can carry on when, I'm, when, I'm, when I go off the air here in a few minutes. Put all your links in then, because I'm not going to get them. They roll off the screen. If you're putting them in for there, put them in for me at the end so that I can check them out. Okay? I'd appreciate that. Yes. Yeah, I saw that movie too. People can't, ha you can't handle the truth. I saw that movie, or at least the clip. I don't think I watched that whole movie. I've just seen the clip over and over and heard it over and over on truther channels. And there are plenty of pagan truthers out there, believe me. Yes, pagan, reprobate, unregenerate truthers. They come a dime a dozen. Very popular, though. Well, hey, you're out there in the world. The world is the majority. Even in the church, the outer court is the majority. So you want to be popular, stick to the outer court and feed them the pablum that they want so badly. And you can become famous and make lots of money. But I'd rather store my treasure up where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, neither can thieves break through and steal. Jesus said it, store up your treasure in heaven. So that's where to go. The gospel of the kingdom, repent 
for the kingdom is at hand. Cross the border into the kingdom of God. And you do that by repentance. The first work that the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life is to, is that work of repentance. So ask Him to help you, to teach you obedience, that you may walk the narrow way that leads to life. That's the kingdom road, the only way, through the blood of the Lamb. See you next time.